you are made up of trillions of drifting atoms specially arranged in a way that will only exist once. To begin with, for you to be here now trillions of drifting atoms had to assemble in an intricate and intriguingly obliging manner to create you. It's an arrangement so specialized and particular that it has never been tried before and will only exist this once. For the next many years, we hope, these tiny particles will uncomplainingly engage in all the billions of deft, cooperative efforts necessary to keep you intact and let you experience the supremely agreeable but generally underappreciated state known as existence. You are an arrangement of specialized atoms that has never existed before, and will only exist once. Why atoms take this trouble is a bit of a puzzle. Being you is not a gratifying experience at the atomic level. For all their devoted attention, your atoms don't care about you indeed, don't even know that you are there. They don't even know that they are there. They are mindless particles, after all, and not even themselves alive. It is a slightly arresting notion that if you were to pick yourself apart with tweezers, one atom at a time, you would produce a mound of fine atomic dust, none of which had ever been alive but all of which had once been you. Yet somehow for the period of your existence, they will answer to a single overarching impulse, to keep you, you. The bad news is that atoms are fickle and their time of devotion is fleeting fleeting indeed. Even a long human life adds up to only about 650,000 hours. And when that modest milestone flashes past, or at some other point thereabouts, for reasons unknown your atoms will shut you down, silently disassemble, and go off to be other things. And that's it for you. Still, you may rejoice that it happens at all. Generally speaking, in the universe, it doesn't, so far as we can tell. This is decidedly odd because the atoms that so liberally and congenitally flock together to form living things on earth are the same atoms that decline to do it elsewhere. Whatever else it may be, at the level of chemistry life is curiously mundane. Carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. A little calcium. A dash of sulfur. A light dusting of other very ordinary elements. Nothing you wouldn't find in any ordinary drugstore, and that's all you need. The only thing special about the atoms that make you is that they make you. That is the miracle of life. Whether or not atoms make life in other corners of the universe, they make plenty else. Indeed, they make everything else. Without them, there would be no water or air or rocks, no stars and planets, no distant gassy clouds or swirling nebulae or any of the other things that make the universe so usefully material. Atoms are so numerous and necessary that we easily overlook that they needn't actually exist at all. Atoms are everything, from water, air, rocks, stars, and planets, they make everything everywhere. No law requires the universe to fill itself with small particles of matter or to produce light and gravity and the other physical properties on which our existence hinges. There needn't actually be a universe at all. For the longest time, there wasn't. There were no atoms and no universe for them to float about in. There was nothing, nothing at all anywhere. A short history of nearly everything, is about how it happened. In particular how we went from there being nothing at all to there being something. And then how little of that something turned into us, and also some of what happened in between and since. That's a great deal to cover, of course. Which is why it is called, a short history of nearly everything, even though it isn't really. It couldn't be. But with luck, by the time we finish, it will feel as if it is. How to build a universe in about the same time it takes to make a sandwich. No matter how hard you try, you will never be able to grasp just how tiny, how spatially unassuming, is a proton. It is just way too small. A proton is an infinitesimal part of an atom, which in itself, of course, an insubstantial thing. Protons are so small that a little dib of ink like the dot on this I can hold something in the region of 500 billion of them, rather more than the number of seconds contained in half a million years. So, protons are exceedingly microscopic, to say the very least. A proton is an infinitesimal part of an atom, which in itself, of course, an insubstantial thing. Now imagine if you can, and of course you can't, shrinking one of those protons down to a billionth of its normal size into a space so small that it would make a proton look enormous. Now pack into that tiny, tiny space about an ounce of matter. Excellent. You are ready to start a universe. This is assuming you are looking to build an inflationary universe. If you'd prefer instead to build a more old-fashioned, standard Big Bang universe, you'll need additional materials. In fact, you will need to gather up everything there is every last mote and particle of matter between here and the edge of creation and squeeze it into a spot so infinitesimally compact that it has no dimensions at all. It is known as a singularity. 
In either case, get ready for a really big bang. Naturally, you will wish to retire to a safe place to observe the spectacle. Unfortunately, there is nowhere to retire to because outside the singularity there is nowhere. When the universe begins to expand, it won't be spreading out to fill a larger emptiness. The only space that exists is the space it creates as it goes. It is natural but wrong to visualize the singularity as a kind of pregnant dot hanging in a dark, boundless void. But there is no space, no darkness. The singularity has no, around, around it. There is no space for it to occupy, no place for it to be. We can't even ask how long it has been there, whether it has just lately popped into being, like a good idea, or whether it has been there forever, quietly awaiting the right moment. Time doesn't exist. There is no past for it to emerge from. And so, from nothing, our universe begins. In a single blinding pulse, a moment of glory much too swift and expansive for any form of words, the singularity assumes heavenly dimensions, space beyond conception. In the first lively second, a second that many cosmologists will devote careers to shaving into ever finer wafers, is produced gravity and the other forces that govern physics. In less than a minute the universe is a million billion miles across and growing fast. There is a lot of heat now, 10 billion degrees of it, enough to begin the nuclear reactions that create the lighter elements, principally hydrogen and helium, with a dash, about one atom in a hundred million, of lithium. In three minutes, 98% of all the matter there is or will ever be has been produced. We have a universe. It is a place of the most wondrous and gratifying possibility, and beautiful, too. And it was all done in about the time it takes to make a sandwich. Just as there is no place where you can find the edge of the universe, there is no place where you can stand at the center and say, this is where Earth began. When considering the universe at large, we don't actually know what is in our solar system. Astronomers these days can do the unimaginable. If you were to strike a match on the moon, they could spot the flare. From observing throbs and wobbles of distant stars they can infer the size and character and even potential habitability of planets much too remote to be seen planet so distant that it would take us half a million years in a spaceship to get there. With radio telescopes, astronomers can capture wisps of radiation so preposterously faint that the total amount of energy collected from outside the solar system by all of them together since collecting began, in 1951, is, less than the energy of a single snowflake striking the ground, in the words of Carl Sagan. There isn't a great deal that goes on in the universe that astronomers can't find if they set their mind to it. This is why it is all the more remarkable to reflect that until 1978 no one had ever noticed that Pluto has a moon. Pluto was discovered in 1978. It doesn't act much like the other planets. It is runty and obscure, and variable in its motions that no one can tell exactly where Pluto will be any time. This was something of a blow to Pluto's status as a planet, which had never been robust anyway. Since previously the space occupied by the Moon and the space occupied by Pluto were thought to be the same, it meant that Pluto was much smaller than anyone had supposed, smaller even than Mercury. Indeed, seven moons in the solar system, including our own, are larger. Now a natural question is why it took so long for anyone to find a Moon in our solar system. The answer is that it is partly a matter of where astronomers point their instruments and partly a matter of what their instruments are designed to detect, and partly it's just Pluto. Mostly it's where they point their instruments. Space, you see, is just enormous, just enormous. Let's imagine, for purposes of edification and entertainment, that we are about to go on a journey by rocket ship. We won't go far. Just to the edge of our solar system. But we need to get a fix on how big a place space is and what a small part of it we occupy. Now the bad news is that we won't be home for supper. Even at the speed of light, it would take seven hours to get to Pluto. But of course, we can't travel at anything like that speed. We'll have to go at the speed of a spaceship, and these are rather more lumbering. The best speeds yet achieved by any human object are those of the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft, which are now flying away from us at about 35,000 miles an hour. One thing you will realize is that space is extremely well-named and rather dismayingly uneventful. Our solar system may be the liveliest thing for trillions of miles, but all the visible stuff in it, the sun, the planets and their moons, the billion or so tumbling rocks of the asteroid belt, comets, and other miscellaneous drifting detritus, fills less than a trillionth of the available space. You also quickly realize that none of the maps you have ever seen of the solar system were remotely drawn to scale. 
Earth might be the liveliest thing for trillion of miles in space. Most schoolroom charts show the planets coming one after the other at neighborly intervals. The outer giants cast shadows over each other in many illustrations. But this is necessary deceit to get them all on the same piece of paper. Neptune, in reality, isn't just a little bit beyond Jupiter. It's way beyond Jupiter. Five times farther from Jupiter than Jupiter is from us. So far out that it receives only 3% as much sunlight as Jupiter. So the solar system is quite enormous. By the time we reach Pluto, we have come so far that the sun, our dear, warm, skin tanning, life giving sun, has shrunk to the size of a pinhead. It is a little more than a bright star. In such a lonely void, you can begin to understand how even the most significant objects, Pluto's moon, for example, have escaped attention. In this respect, Pluto has hardly been alone. Until the Voyager expeditions, Neptune was thought to have two moons. Voyager found six more. Decades ago, the solar system was thought to contain 30 moons. The total now is, at least 90, about a third of which have been found in just the last 10 years. The point to remember, of course, is that when considering the universe at large we don't actually know what is in our solar system. Space is enormous. The average distance between stars out there is 20 million miles. Even at speeds approaching those of light, these are challenging distances for any traveling individual. The mathematical principles of natural philosophy, known as the Principia Halley was an exceptional figure. In the course of a long and productive career, he was a sea captain, a cartographer, a professor of geometry at the University of Oxford, deputy controller of the Royal Mint, the astronomer royal, and inventor of the deep sea diving bell. He wrote authoritatively on magnetism, tides, and the motions of the planets, and fondly on the effects of opium. He invented the weather map and actuarial table, proposed methods for working out the age of the Earth and its distance from the Sun, even devised a practical method for keeping fish fresh out of season. For all his achievements, however, Halley's greatest contribution to human knowledge may simply have been to take part in a modest scientific wager with two other worthies of his day, Robert Hooke, who is perhaps best remembered as the first person to describe a cell, and the great and stately Sir Christopher Wren who was actually an astronomer first and architect second, though that is not often generally remembered now. In 1683, Halley, Hooke, and Wren were dining in London when the conversation turned to the motions of celestial objects. It was known that planets were inclined to orbit in a particular kind of oval known as an ellipse, a very specific and precise curve, to quote Richard Feynman, but it wasn't understood why. Wren generously offered a prize worth 40 shillings, equivalent to a couple of weeks' pay, to whichever of the men could provide a solution. Hooke, who was well known for taking credit for ideas that weren't necessarily his own, claimed that he had solved the problem already but declined now to share it on the interesting and inventive grounds that it would rob others of the satisfaction of discovering the answer for themselves. He would instead, conceal it for some time, that others might know how to value it. If he thought any more on the matter, he left no evidence of it. Haley, however, became consumed with finding the answer, to the point that the following year he traveled to Cambridge and boldly called upon the university's Lucasian professor of mathematics, Isaac Newton, in the hope that he could help. Newton was a decidedly odd figure, brilliant beyond measure, but solitary, joyless, prickly to the point of paranoia, famously distracted. Quite what Haley expected to get from him when he made his unannounced visit in August 1684 we can only guess. But thanks to the later account of a Newton confidant, Abraham de Mavra, we do have a record of one of science's most historic encounters. In 1684 Dr. Haley came to visit at Cambridge, and, after they had some time together the drasked him what he thought the curve would be that would be described by the planets supposing the force of attraction toward the sun to be reciprocal to the square of their distance from it. This was a reference to a piece of mathematics known as the inverse square law which Haley was convinced lay at the heart of the explanation, though he wasn't sure exactly how. Senior Isaac replied immediately that it would be an ellipse. The doctor, struck with joy and amazement, asked him how he knew it. Why, saith he, I have calculated it. Whereupon Dr. Haley asked him for his calculation without further delay Senior Isaac looked among his papers but could not find it. This was astounding, like someone saying he had found a cure for cancer but couldn't remember where he had put the formula. Pressed by Haley, Newton agreed to redo the calculations and produce a paper. He did as promised but then did much more. 
He retired for two years of intensive reflection and scribbling, and at length produced his masterwork, Philosophia e Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, better known as the Principia. Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Every object in the universe exerts a tug on every other. At Principia, S. Hart were Newton's three laws of motion and his universal law of gravitation. Newton's first law. An object moves in the direction in which it is pushed unless acted upon by a force. Principia was one of those moments. It made Newton instantly famous. Newton's second law. An object will keep moving in a straight line until some other force acts to slow or deflect it. To a physicist, mass and weight are two quite different things. Your mass stays the same wherever you go, but your weight varies depending on how far you are from the center of some other massive object like a planet. Newton's third law. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. Einstein's universe. The beginning of the solution to the problem of gravity. Einstein was born in Ulm, in southern Germany, in 1879, but grew up in Munich. Little in his early life suggested the greatness to come. Famously he didn't learn to speak until he was three. In the 1890s, his father's electrical business failing, the family moved to Milan. But Albert, by now a teenager, went to Switzerland to continue his education, though he failed his college entrance exams on the first try. In 1896 he gave up his German citizenship to avoid military conscription and entered the Zurich Polytechnic Institute on a four-year course designed to churn out high school science teachers. He was a bright but not outstanding student. In 1900 he graduated and within a few months was beginning to contribute papers to Annalen der Physik. His very first paper, on the physics of fluids in drinking straws, of all things, appeared in the same issue as Planck's quantum theory. From 1902 to 1904 he produced a series of papers on statistical mechanics only to discover that the quietly productive J. Willard Gibbs in Connecticut had done that work as well, in his Elementary Principles of Statistical Mechanics in 1901. At the same time, he had fallen in love with a fellow student, a Hungarian named Maleva Maric. In 1901 they had a child out of wedlock, a daughter, who was discreetly put up for adoption. Einstein never saw his child. Two years later, he and Marich were married. In between these events, in 1902, Einstein took a job with the Swiss Patent Office, where he stayed for the next seven years. He enjoyed the work. It was challenging enough to engage his mind, but not so challenging as to distract him from his physics. This was the background against which he produced the special theory of relativity in 1905. Called, On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, it is one of the most extraordinary scientific papers ever published, as much for how it was presented as for what it said. It had no footnotes or citations, contained almost no mathematics, made no mention of any work that had influenced or preceded it, and acknowledged the help of just one individual, a colleague at the patent office named Michel Besso. It was as if Einstein had reached the conclusions by pure thought, unaided, without listening to the opinions of others. To a surprisingly large extent, that is precisely what he had done. On the Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, by Einstein is one of the most extraordinary scientific papers ever published. It had no footnotes or citations, contained almost no mathematics, made no mention of any work that had influenced or preceded it. His famous equation, E equals mix squared, did not appear with the paper but came in a brief supplement that followed a few months later. As you will recall from school days, E in the equation stands for energy, M for mass, and squared, S for the speed of light squared. In simplest terms, what the equation says is that mass and energy have an equivalence. They are two forms of the same thing. Energy is liberated matter. Matter is energy waiting to happen. Einstein's equation means there is a huge amount of energy bound up in every material thing. Among much else, Einstein's theory explained how radiation worked. How lump of uranium could throw out constant streams of high-level energy without melting away like an ice cube. It explained how stars could burn for billions of years without racing through their fuel. In 1907, or so it has sometimes been written, Albert Einstein saw workmen fall off a roof and began to think about gravity. Alas, like many good stories this one appears to be apocryphal. According to Einstein himself, he was simply sitting in a chair when the problem of gravity occurred to him. Actually, what occurred to Einstein was something more like the beginning of a solution to the problem of gravity, since it had been evident to him from the outset that one thing missing from the special theory was gravity. 
What was special about the special theory was that it dealt with things moving in an essentially unimpeded state. But what happened when a thing in motion, light, above all, encountered an obstacle such as gravity? It was a question that would occupy his thoughts for most of the next decade and lead to the publication in early 1917 of a paper entitled, Cosmological Considerations on the General Theory of Relativity. Einstein was honored, somewhat vaguely, for services to theoretical physics. He had to wait 16 years, till 1921, to receive the award. Frederick Rhinus, who detected the neutrino in 1957 but wasn't honored with a Nobel until 1995. The German Ernst Ruska, who invented the electron microscope in 1932 and received his Nobel Prize in 1986, more than half a century after the fact. The advent of the tiny and ever mysterious atom. While Einstein and other scientists were productively unraveling the large scale structure of the cosmos, others were struggling to understand something closer to hand but in its way just as remote the tiny and ever mysterious atom. The basic working arrangement of atoms is the molecule, from the Latin for little mass. A molecule is simply two or more atoms working together in a more or less stable arrangement. Add two atoms of hydrogen to one of oxygen and you have a molecule of water. A molecule is two or more atoms working together. Chemists tend to think in terms of molecules rather than elements in much the way that writers tend to think in terms of words and not letters. So it is molecules they count, and these are numerous, to say the least. At sea level, at a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit, one cubic centimeter of air, that is, a space about the size of a sugar cube, will contain 45 billion molecules and they are in every single cubic centimeter you see around you. Think about how many cubic centimeters there are in the world outside your window. How many sugar cubes it would take to fill that view. Then think how many it would take to build a universe. Atoms, in short, are very abundant. Every atom is made from three kinds of elementary particles. Protons, which have a positive electrical charge. Electrons, which have a negative electrical charge. And neutrons, which have no charge. Protons and neutrons are packed into the nucleus, while electrons spin around outside. They are also fantastically durable. Because they are so long-lived, atoms really get around. Every atom you possess has almost certainly passed through several stars and been part of millions of organisms on its way to becoming you. We are each so atomically numerous and so vigorously recycled at death that a significant number of our atoms, up to a billion for each of us, it has been suggested, probably once belonged to Shakespeare. A billion more each came from Buddha and Genghis Khan and Beethoven, and any other historical figure you care to name. Every atom that makes you almost has been part of millions of organisms on its way to becoming you. So we are all reincarnations, though short-lived ones. When we die our atoms will disassemble and move off to find new uses elsewhere, as part of a leaf or other human being or drop of dew. Atoms, however, go on practically forever. Nobody actually knows how long an atom can survive. But according to Martin Rees, it is probably about 1,035 years, a number so big that even I am happy to express it in notation. When we die our atoms will disassemble and move off to find new uses elsewhere, as part of a leaf or other human being or drop of dew. Atoms, however, go on practically forever. Nobody actually knows how long an atom can survive. Above all, atoms are tiny, very tiny indeed. Half a million of them lined up shoulder to shoulder could hide behind a human hair. On such a scale an individual atom is essentially impossible to imagine, but we can of course try. Neutrons don't influence an atom's identity, but they do add to its mass. The number of neutrons is generally about the same as the number of protons, but they can vary up and down slightly. Add a neutron or two and you get an isotope. Dalton was born in 1766 on the edge of the Lake District near Cockermouth to a family of poor but devout Quaker weavers. He was an exceptionally bright student. At 15, still schoolmastering, he took a job in the nearby town of Kendall, and a decade after that he moved to Manchester, scarcely stirring from there for the remaining 50 years of his life. In Manchester he became something of an intellectual whirlwind, producing books and papers on subjects ranging from meteorology to grammar. It was a plump book called A New System of Chemical Philosophy, published in 1808, that established his reputation. There, in a short chapter of just five pages, out of the book's more than 900, people of learning first encountered atoms in something approaching their modern conception. 
Dalton's simple insight was that at the root of all matter are exceedingly tiny, irreducible particles. We might as well attempt to introduce a new planet into the solar system or annihilate one already in existence, as to create or destroy a particle of hydrogen, he wrote. Neither the idea of atoms nor the term itself was exactly new. Both had been developed by the ancient Greeks. Dalton's contribution was to consider the relative sizes and characters of these atoms and how they fit together. He knew, for instance, that hydrogen was the lightest element, so he gave it an atomic weight of one. He believed also that water consisted of seven parts of oxygen to one of hydrogen, and so he gave oxygen an atomic weight of seven. By such means was he able to arrive at the relative weights of the known elements. He wasn't always terribly accurate. Oxygen's atomic weight is actually 16, not 7. But the principle was sound and formed the basis for all of modern chemistry and much of the rest of modern science. It was Einstein who provided the first incontrovertible evidence of atoms' existence with his paper on Brownian motion in 1905. But this attracted little attention and, in any case, Einstein was soon to become consumed with his work on general relativity. So, the first real hero of the atomic age, if not the first personage on the scene, was Ernest Rutherford. He determined the structure and nature of the atom. The lonely, mild, blue watery globe that supports life. It isn't easy being an organism. In the whole universe, as far as we yet know, there is only one place, an inconspicuous outpost of the Milky Way called Earth, that will sustain you, and even it can be pretty grudging. From the bottom of the deepest ocean trench to the top of the highest mountain, the zone that covers nearly the whole of known life is only something over a dozen miles, not much when set against the roominess of the cosmos at large. For humans, it is even worse because we happen to belong to the portion of living things that took the rash but venturesome decision 400 million years ago to crawl out of the seas and become a land-based and oxygen-breathing. In consequence, no less than 99.5% of the world's habitable space by volume, according to one estimate, is fundamentally, in practical terms completely, off-limits to us. About 99.5% of the world's habitable space by volume is off-limit to humans. It isn't simply that we can't breathe in water, but that we couldn't bear the pressures. Because water is about 1,300 times heavier than air, pressures rise swiftly as you descend, by the equivalent of one atmosphere for every 10 meters, 33 feet, of depth. On land, if you rose to the top of a 500-foot eminence, Cologne Cathedral or the Washington Monument, say, the change in pressure would be so slight as to be indiscernible. At the same depth underwater, however, your veins would collapse and your lungs would compress to the approximate dimensions of a Coke can. Other organisms do of course manage to deal with the pressures at depth, though quite how some of them do so is a mystery. The deepest point in the ocean is the Mariana Trench in the Pacific. There, some seven miles down, the pressures rise to over 16,000 pounds per square inch. We have managed once, briefly, to send humans to that depth in a sturdy diving vessel. Yet it is home to colonies of amphipods, a type of crustacean similar to shrimp but transparent, which survive without any protection at all. Nearly everyone, including the authors of some popular books on oceanography, assumes that the human body would crumple under the immense pressures of the deep ocean. In fact, this appears not to be the case. Because we are made largely of water ourselves, and water is, virtually incompressible, in the words of Francis Ashcroft of Oxford University, the body remains at the same pressure as the surrounding water, and is not crushed at depth. It is the gases inside your body, particularly in the lungs, that cause the trouble. These do compress, though at what point the compression becomes fatal is not known. Earth is not the easiest place to be an organism, even if it is the only place. Of the small portion of the planet's surface that is dry enough to stand on, a surprisingly large amount is too hot or cold or dry or steep or lofty to be of much use to us. Partly, it must be conceded, this is our fault. In terms of adaptability, humans are pretty amazingly useless. Earth is the only known planet that supports life, but it is not the easiest of place to be an organism. Like most animals, we don't much like really hot places, but because we sweat so freely and easily stroke, we are especially vulnerable. In the worst circumstances, on foot without water in a hot desert, most people will grow delirious and keel over, possibly never to rise again, in no more than six or seven hours. We are no less helpless in the face of cold. Like all mammals, humans are good at generating heat but, because we are so nearly hairless, not good at keeping it. 
Even in quite mild weather half the calories you burn go to keep your body warm. Yet when you consider conditions elsewhere in the known universe, the wonder is not that we use so little of our planet but that we have managed to find a planet that we can use even a bit of. You have only to look at our solar system, or, come to that, Earth at certain periods in its history, to appreciate that most places are much harsher and much less amenable to life than our mild, blue watery globe. Various observers have identified about two dozen particularly helpful breaks we have had on Earth, but distill them down to the principal four. 1. Excellent location. We are, to an almost uncanny degree, the right distance from the right sort of star, one that is big enough to radiate lots of energy, but not so big as to burn itself out swiftly. It is a curiosity of physics that the larger a star the more rapidly it burns. Had our sun been ten times as massive, it would have exhausted itself after ten million years instead of ten billion and we wouldn't be here now. We are also fortunate to orbit where we do. Too much nearer and everything on Earth would have boiled away. Much farther away and everything would have frozen. 2. The right kind of planet. Geophysicists, when asked to count their blessings, would not include living on a planet with a molten interior, but it's a pretty near certainty that without all that magma swirling around beneath us we wouldn't be here now. Apart from much else, our lively interior created the outgassing that helped to build an atmosphere and provided us with the magnetic field that shields us from cosmic radiation. It also gave us plate tectonics, which continually renews and rumples the surface. If Earth were perfectly smooth, it would be covered everywhere with water to a depth of 4 kilometers. There might be life in that lonesome ocean, but there certainly wouldn't be baseball. 3. We're a twin planet. Not many of us normally think of the moon as a companion planet, but that is in effect what it is. Most moons are tiny in relation to their master's planet. The Martian satellites of Phobos and Deimos, for instance, are only about 10 kilometers in diameter. Our moon, however, is more than a quarter the diameter of the Earth, which makes ours the only planet in the solar system with a sizable moon in comparison to itself, except Pluto, which doesn't really count because Pluto is itself so small, and what a difference that makes to us. 4. Timing. The universe is an amazingly fickle and eventful place, and our existence within it is a wonder. If a long and unimaginably complex sequence of events stretching back 4.6 billion years or so hadn't played out in a particular manner at particular times. If, to take just one obvious instance, the dinosaurs hadn't been wiped out by a meteor when they were, you might well be six inches long, with whiskers and a tail, and reading this in a burrow. Oxygen is not combustible, it merely facilitates the combustion of other things. If oxygen were combustible, each time you lit a match all the air around you would burr into flame. Hydrogen gas, on the other hand, is extremely combustible. The atmosphere is a 15-foot thickness of protective concrete that protects us from invisible visitors from space. The atmosphere keeps us warm. Without it, Earth would be a lifeless ball of ice with an average temperature of minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Also, the atmosphere absorbs or deflects incoming swarms of cosmic rays, charged particles, ultraviolet rays, and the like. Altogether, the gaseous padding of the atmosphere is equivalent to a 15-foot thickness of protective concrete, and without it, these invisible visitors from space would slice through us like tiny daggers. Even raindrops would pound us senseless if it weren't for the atmosphere's slowing drag. Without the atmosphere, the Earth would be a lifeless ball of ice. The most striking thing about our atmosphere is that there isn't very much of it. It extends upward for about 120 miles, which might seem reasonably bounteous when viewed from ground level, but if you shrank the Earth to the size of a standard desktop globe it would only be about the thickness of a couple of coats of varnish. For scientific convenience, the atmosphere is divided into four unequal layers, troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and ionosphere, now often called the thermosphere. The troposphere is the part that's dear to us. It alone contains enough warmth and oxygen to allow us to function, though even it swiftly becomes uncongenial to life as you climb up through it. From ground level to its highest point, the troposphere, or, turning sphere, is about 10 miles thick at the equator and no more than 6 or 7 miles high in the temperate latitudes where most of us live. 80% of the atmosphere's mass, virtually all the water, and thus virtually all the weather is contained within this thin and wispy layer. There really isn't much between you and oblivion. Beyond the troposphere is the stratosphere. When you see the top of a storm cloud flattening out into the classic anvil shape, you're looking at the boundary between the troposphere and stratosphere. 
This invisible ceiling is known as the trop a pas and was discovered in 1902 by a Frenchman in a balloon, Léon Philippe Tesserens de Bort. In the 1780s when people began to make experimental balloon ascents in Europe, something that surprised them was how chilly it got as they rose. The temperature drops about 3 degrees Fahrenheit with every thousand feet you climb. Logic would seem to indicate that the closer you get to a source of heat, the warmer you would feel. Part of the explanation is that you are not really getting nearer the sun in any meaningful sense. The sun is 93 million miles away. To move a couple of thousand feet closer to it is like taking one step closer to a bushfire in Australia when you are standing in Ohio, and expecting to smell smoke. The answer again takes us back to the question of the density of molecules in the atmosphere. Sunlight energizes atoms. It increases the rate at which they jiggle and jounce, and in their enlivened state they crash into one another, releasing heat. When you feel the sun warm on your back on a summer's day, it's excited atoms you feel. The higher you climb, the fewer molecules there are, and so the fewer collisions between them. Sunlight increases the rate at which atoms jiggle and jounce. Air is deceptive stuff. Even at sea level, we tend to think of the air as being ethereal and all but weightless. In fact, it has plenty of bulk, and that bulk often exerts itself. As a marine scientist named Wyville Thompson wrote more than a century ago, we sometimes find when we get up in the morning, by a rise of an inch in the barometer, that nearly half a ton has been quietly piled upon us during the night, but we experience no inconvenience, rather a feeling of exhilaration and buoyancy, since it requires a little less exertion to move our bodies in the denser medium. The reason you don't feel crushed under that extra half ton of pressure is the same reason your body would not be crushed deep beneath the sea. It is made mostly of incompressible fluids, which push back, equalizing the pressures within and without. The process that moves air around in the atmosphere is the same process that drives the planet's internal engine, namely convection. Moist, warm air from the equatorial regions rises until it hits the tropopause barrier and spreads out. As it travels away from the equator and cools, it sinks. When it hits bottom, some of the sinking air looks for an area of low pressure to fill and heads back for the equator, completing the circuit. The process that moves air around in the atmosphere is the same process that drives the internal engine of the planet, namely convection. Life is amazing and gratifying, perhaps even miraculous, but hardly impossible. Stanley Miller, a graduate student at the University of Chicago, in 1953, took two flasks, one containing a little water to represent a primeval ocean, the other holding a mixture of methane, ammonia, and hydrogen sulfide gases to represent Earth's early atmosphere, connected them with rubber tubes, and introduced some electrical sparks as a stand-in for lightning. After a few days, the water in the flasks had turned green and yellow in a hearty broth of amino acids, fatty acids, sugars, and other organic compounds. If God didn't do it this way, observed Miller's delighted supervisor, the Nobel laureate Harold Urey, he missed a good bet. Press reports of the time made it sound like all that was needed now was for somebody to give the whole a good shake, and life would crawl out. As time has shown, it wasn't nearly so simple. Despite half a century of further study, we are no nearer to synthesizing life today than we were in 1953 and much further away from thinking we can. Scientists are now pretty certain that the early atmosphere was nothing like as primed for development as Miller and Urey's gaseous stew, but rather was a much less reactive blend of nitrogen and carbon dioxide. Repeating Miller's experiments with these more challenging inputs has so far produced only one fairly primitive amino acid. At all events, creating amino acids is not really the problem. The problem is the proteins. Proteins are what you get when you string amino acids together, and we need a lot of them. No one really knows, but there may be as many as a million types of protein in the human body, and each one is a little miracle. By all the laws of probability, proteins shouldn't exist. To make a protein you need to assemble amino acids in a particular order, in much the same way that you assemble letters in a particular order to spell a word. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. The problem is that words in the amino acid alphabet are often exceedingly long. To spell collagen, the name of a common type of protein, you need to arrange eight letters in the right order. But to make collagen, you need to arrange 1,055 amino acids in precisely the right sequence. But, and here's an obvious but crucial point, you don't make it. It makes itself, spontaneously, without direction, and this is where the unlikelihoods come in. 
The chances of a 1055 sequence molecule like collagen spontaneously self assembling are, frankly, nil. It just isn't going to happen. Proteins, in short, are complex entities. Hemoglobin is only 146 amino acids long, a runt by protein standards, yet even it offers 10,190 possible amino acid combinations, which is why it took the Cambridge University chemist Max Perutz 23 years to unravel it. We are talking about several hundred thousand types of protein, perhaps a million, each unique and each, as far as we know, vital to the maintenance of a sound and happy you. And it goes on from there. A protein to be of use must not only assemble amino acids in the right sequence but then must engage in a kind of chemical origami and fold itself into a very specific shape. Even having achieved this structural complexity, a protein is no good to you if it can't reproduce itself, and proteins can't. For this you need DNA. DNA is a whiz at replicating. It can make a copy of itself in seconds, but can do virtually nothing else. So we have a paradoxical situation. Proteins can't exist without DNA, and DNA has no purpose without proteins. Are we to assume then that they arose simultaneously to support each other? If so, wow, proteins can't exist without DNA, and DNA has no purpose without proteins. And there is more still. DNA, proteins, and the other components of life couldn't prosper without some sort of membrane to contain them. No atom or molecule has ever achieved life independently. Pluck any atom from your body, and it is no more alive than is a grain of sand. It is only when they come together within the nurturing refuge of a cell that these diverse materials can take part in the amazing dance that we call life. Without the cell, they are nothing more than interesting chemicals. But without the chemicals, the cell has no purpose. Chemical reactions of the sort associated with life are actually something of a commonplace. It may be beyond us to cook them up in a lab, a la Stanley Miller and Harold Urey but the universe does it readily enough. Lots of molecules in nature get together to form long chains called polymers. Sugars constantly assemble to form starches. Crystals can do a number of lifelike things, replicate, respond to environmental stimuli, take on a pattern complexity. They've never achieved life itself, of course, but they demonstrate repeatedly that complexity is a natural, spontaneous, entirely commonplace event. There may or may not be a great deal of life in the universe at large, but there is no shortage of ordered self-assembly, in everything from the transfixing symmetry of snowflakes to the comely rings of Saturn. The bottom line is that life is amazing and gratifying, perhaps even miraculous, but hardly impossible, as we repeatedly attest with our own modest existences. To be sure, many of the details of life's beginnings remain pretty imponderable. Every scenario you have ever read concerning the conditions necessary for life involves water, from the warm little pond, where Darwin supposed life began to the bubbling sea vents that are now the most popular candidates for life's beginnings, but all this overlooks the fact that to turn monomers into polymers, which is to say, to begin to create proteins, involves what is known to biology as dehydration linkages. As one leading biology text puts it, with perhaps just a tiny hint of discomfort, Researchers agree that such reactions would not have been energetically favorable in the primitive sea, or indeed in any aqueous medium, because of the mass action law. It is a little like putting sugar in a glass of water and having it become a cube. It shouldn't happen, but somehow in nature, it does. The actual chemistry of all this is a little arcane for our purposes here, but it is enough to know that if you make monomers wet, they don't turn into polymers, except when creating life on Earth. How and why it happens then and not otherwise is one of biology's great unanswered questions. Conclusion. The fact is, we don't know. Don't have any idea. We don't know when we started doing many of the things we've done. We don't know what we are doing right now or how our present actions will affect the future. What we do know is that there is only one planet to do it on and only one species of being capable of making a considered difference. If, a short history of nearly everything, has a lesson, it is that we are awfully lucky to be here, and by, we, this means every living thing. To attain any kind of life in this universe of ours appears to be quite an achievement. As humans we are doubly lucky, of course. We enjoy not only the privilege of existence but also the singular ability to appreciate it and even, in a multitude of ways, to make it better. It is a talent we have only barely begun to grasp. We have arrived at this position of eminence in a stunningly short time. Behaviorally modern human beings, that is, people who can speak and make art and organize complex activities, 
have existed for only about 0.0001% of Earth's history. But surviving for even that little while has required a nearly endless string of good fortune. We are at the beginning of it all. The trick, of course, is to make sure we never find the end. And that, almost certainly, will require a good deal more than lucky breaks. <laughs>